Hello, everyone, and welcome. In the previous episode, we discussed workload identity, SPIPI, and SPIRE in great detail. If you missed that episode, you can click on this notification up here. In this episode, we are going to look at an implementation of SPIPI and SPIRE in uh, Cilium and see how Cilium um, implements its own MTLS, lightweight, lightweight MTLS. So here's the agenda for this episode. We're going to talk about, first of all, we'll discuss what uh, MTLS is in the context of the classic MTLS. And then we talk about some of the issues with the classic implementation of MTLS and why it caused uh, Cilium and other vendors are looking into uh, doing different implementation of MTLS, a more, more lightweight uh, version of MTLS. Then we'll look at uh, Swiffy and Spire. We'll take to do a quick overview again for those who might have missed um, the previous episode or you just need a, those who have watched it but need an, a refresher. So we'll go through again a quick overview of what Swiffy and Spire are. And then we'll talk in great detail on how Cilium leverages Spire server to provide mutual authentication or MTLS. We'll then close by doing a demo to see how we can integrate uh, Spiffy and Spire into a Cilium installation. And we do a quick demo of how mutual authentication is done in Cilium. The classic MTLS, which stands for Mutual TLS, is a framework that provides two functionality. Mutual authentication, so the client and server can authenticate each other, and TLS, which is a protocol that, that provides an encrypted channel, a secure channel between these two parties, so they can communicate um, knowing that nobody can listen into their conversation. So these two features, um, you cannot really opt in or out. So if you are using MTLS, so those are the two features that you must use. So let's kind of walk through the process of how this uh, authentication, mutual authentication and encryption actually happen. So the first thing that you need to realize that clients and, certificate and the servers have their own certificates. And these are basically a method for identifying each other. So the client, when they present itself, they use a certificate to say who they are. And the server, same thing. When they want to present and talk to the client, they need to present themselves, and that, that is a server certificate that will be used to do that. They also have each, um, they have what is known as trusted root certificates authorities, and these are a collection of CAs or certificate authorities that each side support. So whatever, um, certificate that is used, for instance, this client certificate needs to be signed by a CA that is trusted by the server. And conversely, the certificate that the server is used needs, um, needs to come from a CA that is trusted by the client. So the first thing that the client does to initiate this conversation is to what is known as a TLS handshake. And it's literally called client hello. Basically, the, the client says, hello, I support this version of TLS, so the whatever version of TLS that it supports, um, what, what kind of algorithm uh, for encryption and compression it supports. Um, so this needs to match. If the, later on the server provides something else that it may be a different version of TLS or different um, algorithm format, if they don't match them, they, they can't really converse, uh, communicate with each other. And also, the client generates a random key and sends that key to the uh, server. In return, server also does the same thing. It initiates a server hello, and again, talks about what kind of, uh, what version of TLS it supports, what kind of um, algorithms, uh, libraries for encryption and also compression, it supports. It also generates a random key and sends that to the client. So now each one has the random key that the other party generated. So this would be, they don't use to generate uh, a 
symmetric key for encrypting messages. The next thing that happens is the server sends its server certificate to the client for validation, basically to ensure this is the authentication part of the um, algorithm. So the, the client will, uh, make, will need to ensure that this, this, the certificate is valid and it's signed by the CA that it trusts. So if you look at the certificate, there are a number of attributes such as service uh, public key, serial number, um, validity period, if the certi certificate is still valid or not, server's DN or domain name, issuer's domain name, and issuer's digital signature. So every certificate is signed by an authority. And that we use by, information will be used by the client to validate the certificate. The first thing that it needs to ensure is that the, the certificate has not expired. Then it uh, checks the at the end um, or domain name, issuer domain name with uh, issuer domain name uh, by the CA that is trust to ensure they match. And it also uses the CA's uh, public key to validate the signature that is on the certificate is valid. So at this point, the client it can um, can assume that the the server is it it is what is uh, claimed to be. And in reverse, the client also sends its own certificate to the server. And server goes through the same process as we discussed here to ensure that the client certificate is valid and is signed by an authority that it trusts. So now that these two have establish that a trust between themselves, the next thing that happens is the um, client generates what is known as a pre-master key. And it uses the public key that came on the, which is on the server certificate to encrypt that pre-master key and sends it over to the server. And the server uses its private key to unencrypt that. And now both parties have all these keys and both parties they use independently, use an agreed upon algorithm to generate four sets of keys. So let's go through this. Service encryption key is used by server to encrypt messages that is sending to the client. And client encryption key is used by the client to encrypt the message that is sent to the server. The client MAC key is used to sign the certificate that the client sends to the server and reversely, and also to validate the messages that, that, that can be used by the server to, to validate that the message um, that, it, the, that the message that came from the, um, the client, um, the signature on that message is valid and is coming from the client and is not being forged. And conversely, the same thing on the server side, it has a, a server MAC key again to sign this, the messages that are going to the, the client and then the server MAC key that client can use to ensure that the message, the, 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 the signature that is on the message is, is actually signed by the server. At this point now, the client can initiate a service call. For instance, it wants to call a server uh, on the other side. This is the ad address of the server, service that it wants to call. It uses the client encryption key to encrypt it. It also uses the MAC key to sign it. And then sends that over to the server. Server uses the client um, encryption key to decrypt that and also it uses the MAC key to validate the signature that was on that message to ensure it is actually coming from the client. Then it sends a message to whatever service is behind the scene that is listening for that and then the, ser the service then generates a response, let's say a simple hello world that needs to now send back to the client. So the server uses its um, encryption key to encrypt it and it uses the, its MAC key to um, sign it and it sends it over 
to the client and client basically does this reverse. It uses server marketing and sure is coming from the server and it also uses the server key, um, encryption key to decrypt us. So this is basically an overview of how the classic MTLS works. So again, the, the point here is that the um, MTLS provides encryption as well as um, mutual authentication. They can't really opt out of any of these two features. Cilium takes a different approach when it comes to MTLS. It splits the mutual authentication and message encryption into different options or feature sets. So you can opt in um, if you want uh, one or both. So let's say you only need to um, provide mutual authentication between the client and the server, or you only need encryption. You don't really need mutual authentication. You, and so you're free to do that. So that provides that flexibility that the classical MTLS does not provide. The other thing, thing that it does, it provides a framework where different um, various providers of secure CA, such as Spiffy, Cert Manager, or Issue, can be used. At the time of recording, only Spiffy was supported, so Spiffy is used as a CA authority. So uh, as we talked about Spiffy in the previous episode, and we're going to talk about that next, but briefly, Spiffy provides um, client uh, or certificates that can be used by um, your client and server to be able to uh, authenticate each other. So that's the first part, which is authentication. Again, it's very flexible. And then it doesn't use any sidecar, which is you know another great benefit of using um, Cilium. On the other side, for encryption, let's talk about we have a client and a server. Let's say we have this wants to so this service wants to talk to a different service. Uh, so the first thing that you want to do is um, first you want to decide: do we need um, mutual authentication? If yes, then it initiates a TLS handshake between Cilium agents. So rather than the client pause directly be involved in that, that kind of delegated to the Cilium agents so on their behalf, provide the TLS handshake to ensure that the client and server are and they, what they you know, um, claim to be. So that's part of the mutual authentication is handled by Cilium agent. And then, at, the, at this point now, you want to send a message. Again, it's up to you if you want to encrypt the message or not. If encryption is needed, then Cilium um, provides uh, WireGuard or IPsec, so that basically encrypts uh, the whole channel. So rather than providing um, a symmetric um, algorithm for encryption that we talked about in M MTLS earlier, uh, it actually in, in, in encrypt the whole thing. So rather than uh, just TCP, other uh, protocols such as UDP um, and ICMP are also uh, supported. So again, um, the, the, the benefits is that we can opt in to uh, either um, authentication, mutual authentication, or encryption, or both. So it's really up to you based on your needs to uh, pick your to make your decision. So a number of benefits that Cilium Mesh provides. The first one is uh, connections don't need to be terminated anymore because there is no site card is being used. So there is no the site card sits between uh, you know the client and server and the between server and the client. So those are managed by site card. So that goes away by by this approach and and the. The connection is, you know, need not to be uh, terminated. The other benefit is uh, because there is no side card, the authentication on, um, can be done on behalf of the client and server through um, Cilium agent that we talked about. Again, so there's no need for side card, which provides a tremendous amount of uh, overhead. And as we mentioned, um, we can use multiple uh, protocols, um, such as not only TCP, but can use UDP, ICMP, 
HTTP and so on. You are not really limited to TCP anymore. And again, it supports existing um, identity providers such as Spiffy uh, today and maybe in the future other ones such as Cert Manager or SEO. So that functionality or functionality will be there in the future. And also the encryption is optional. So that is the um, kind of most time consuming and you know, resource consuming part of the whole MTLS is encrypting and decrypting messages that goes over the wire. So again, it's really up to you to opt in or out of any of these uh, two features. I covered Spiffy and Spire in great detail in the previous episode. If you are new to these discussions and want to know more, I highly encourage you to watch the previous episode. Here, we're going to provide a quick overview of what they are. So starting with uh, Spiffy, Spiffy stands for Secure Production Identity Framework for Everyone. And it is a set of open source standards for securely identifying software systems in dynamic and heterogeneous environments. So really the great thing about this uh, Spiffy framework is when the workloads uh, start in whatever environment they are, be it in Windows or Linux or be in Kubernetes, um, by the virtue of actually existing in the environment, the identity can be verified. And then through a Spiffy specification, the implementer can issue short-lived certificates for, uh, as identity. Um, identification for those workloads. And those identities then can be used, certificate can be used for things such as a mutual authentication. So let's take a look, a quick look at the components of Spiffy. The first one is trust domain. So a trust domain is basically the security boundary in which all the workloads or systems that reside will be managed by uh, Spiffy. Um, for instance, in this case, we have a trust domain call, and this is the format on um, spiffy slash slash and the name of the domain. And depending on what the domain is, really up to the uh, application or environment that uh, you're setting it up. For instance, this one, um, maybe a company called acne.com. And so we have two domains, trust domain, one for production environment and one for staging environment. And then each one of those environments is served by a CA or a um, certificate authority that provides certificates for uh, as identities. The workload is any piece of software that runs in this environment, such as a Kubernetes pod or you know a standalone um, Linux application or Windows application. So that becomes a workload, and the workload. Um, is will be given what is known as a Spiffy ID. And this is how we identify the workload. And this is the format again, Spiffy, and then the trust domain, whatever they are um, coming from, and then slash, and then there could be anything. Again, uh, for instance, this is a H, maybe H, an HR system. So this is the name, the Spiffy ID for that is this. Uh, Spiffy also, uh, the framework, defines the Spiffy verification identity document or uh, SV. So this is basically an X509 certificate. And this is used as the official identification of this workload when it wants to communicate with other workloads. The trust bundle basically is all the uh, CAs that is, is trusted by this workload. If you recall when we discussed MTLS at the beginning of the session, we talked about the storage or the certificate storage store where all the CA, all the trusted CA reside. This is a kind of version of that. So this will be um, populated by all the CAs that the workload supports. So obviously it supports its own CA because that's what, um, you know, the, the certificate will be uh, provided by this CA. But we can also set up trust between domains. So maybe if we set up a domain with the other one, so now this workload um, will support or will trust two CAs. 
And the workload API is basically an API that the workloads can connect to and that to get its API, to get its identity. So that's what it's being used for. Spire is a production ready implementation of the Spiffy APIs that performs node and workload attestation in order to securely issue SVIDs to workloads and verify the SVIDs of other workloads based on a predefined set of conditions. So in a nutshell, Spire is really an implementation of the Spiffy framework that we talked about. So this is the architecture of a Spiffy um, environment or a Spire environment. Um, it has what is known as a Spire server. So this is basically really the, high, the, the brain of the whole operation is Spire server. And it re, um, exposes a couple of important APIs. One is registration API through which workload can be registered with the Spire server and Spire server can then um, issue certificate for them later on. And also the node API, and this is how agents communicate to um, the server, uh, the Spire server. And then we have workloads. So each um, agent uh, is installed on you know, a specific node. For instance, in the Kubernetes environments, on um, whatever number of uh, worker nodes that you have in your environment, then that, not, that many a number of agents will be installed. So there will be a, an agent per uh, worker node that will be installed on each server. And then the agent is responsible to managing the workloads to go through the attestation pr um, process. So attestation basically means verification, to verify the workloads as they come online and also request a certificate from the Aspire server for them. And also the agent themselves, when they wake up, they have to go through their attestation, they go through their verification process, and then verify their identity to Aspire server. And Aspire server also issues uh, SVIDs for the agent as well. So SVIDs are not just for, for local, they're also for agents that come as part of the installation. So hopefully by now, you should have some good understanding of what MTLS, um, Spiffy, and Spire are. Now let's concentrate on what happens when we install um, Spire as part of Cilium installation. So when we install Cilium, uh, we obviously need to install Cilium itself. So in this case, we use Helm, Helm install. Cilium, and then we specify the namespace that we want all the artifacts of Cilium to be installed in, inside Kubernetes. And then we need to specify um, four additional settings. Let's go through them. The first one is set authentication.mutual.spire.install.enable is equal to true. So this one says when you install Cilium, also install uh, Spire. The next uh, setting, we need to also in enable that. So the same, similar to above, we just say dot enable is equal to true. So once we, um, Spire is installed, we want to also be automatically enabled. And the next uh, two options are, or settings, um, that um, has to do with the storage because uh, Cilium, uh, sorry, Spire uses databases and caches and requires uh, storage in order to function. So the third uh, option is dot, uh, data storage dot enable is equal to true. So we need to set that. And the last option, we need to set a, a data storage dot storage class equal to and the name of the storage class. So we need to set up a storage class ahead of time. We'll go through the um, process of how we can do that during the demo, but just kept, for now keep that in mind. So once we execute this command, then it will install Cilium and Aspire into our environment. So let's kind of review what we have so far. In our Kubernetes environment, we, are, we have already, assuming we have already created the Kubernetes master and our node, worker nodes, then it will all, then install Cilium and also the Aspire environment into this environment. So we have the Kubernetes master, which 
uh, contains of control plane. Uh, and control plane basically consists of the control controller manager, the scheduler, the API server, and etcd. And then on each node, we have the queue proxy. And the queue proxy is responsible for managing all the pods that are running on that particular node. Then as part of our installation, we just specified, it will also in, set up our Cilium environment, which consists of, uh, among other things, the Cilium operator and Cilium agent. So these are an integral part of Cilium. And that happens on all nodes. Uh, and then it installs the Spire server. And on each node, it will also uh, set up a Spire uh, agent. Then at Immediately after that, the Cilium operator creates a number of CRDs. So CRDs basically are new data types that didn't exist before. And this is a way of extending a Kubernetes environment. And these are uh, data types that are specific to Cilium, such as Cilium identity. So Cilium identity is used when a pod is created um, internally. Cilium manages and tracks that uh, that path through the, uh, this identity. Cilium endpoint that manages the endpoints and Cilium network policy, which uh, all the policies that are created are saved here. So there are more CRDs that are installed, but this, uh, I just want to talk about these three here. At some point then, the uh, Aspire server uh, starts, and then the first thing that it does, it generates a trust bundle so a trust bundle basically is a list of trusted CAs that and can be trusted in this trust domain, in our trust domain here. Then it, uh, the API, registration API and node API, which are the two main um, gateway into the API server, they start. And so now our Spire server is ready to serve. And then on each node we have the Spire agent, they, they, will, they wake up and, and they, need, they need to go through the um, attestation process. Basically, they, the way that they authenticate themselves to the node attester, because they don't have, at this point, don't have any um, user ID and password. There's no certificate at this point, They're not issued. Um, so they, they need to somehow authenticate themselves. And the way they do it is um, on the Kubernetes environment, there is the uh, Kubernetes um, node um, attester that uses the service account token that's as associated with the node. And that sent, is sent to the Spire server, and Spire server sends this to API server to ensure that this agent is, uh, says, uh, you know, who it is. And it's actually, this agent is installed in this environment and not some other environment. Once that, checks out, then the Aspire agent generates a certificate and sends the bundle, trust bundle to it. And then from this point on, all the kind of conversation that happens, the Aspire agent, now it has a certificate and will use that certificate to authenticate itself to the API, um, to the uh, Aspire server. Cilium operator and Cilium agent also go through the same similar process to um, through the attestation process, and each one gets the trust bundle and get get their own uh, certificates, um, SVID certificates. Um, so, and this happens on all nodes. Again, the other nodes go through the same process of node attestation to get its uh, SVID or certificate trust bundle and each Cilium operator and um, agent also go through the same process, and they also get their own certificates plus the um, trust bundle. Okay, at this point, let's say we want to deploy a, a, an application. Let's say we have a client server application. First, we install the client, and that request goes to the API server. API server sends it to the Q proxy and the Q proxy in collaboration with the um, runtime uh, CNI uh, container runtime environment, it uh, creates and downloads the uh, the container. Then the CNI gets involved 
and then make sure that container is actually part and set up all the network networking required. And now we have this part here. The next thing that the operator does, it generates an identity for it and send that uh, identity and saves it into the Cilium identity CRD in the etcd. And immediately after that, it also generate an uh, SVP ID. And this is the, uh, the, the URL or the format, SVP colon dash dash spiffy dot cilium. So this is basically, this is a trust domain and the, the trust domain, this trust domain is called spiffy colon slash slash spiffy dot cilium. And then slash identity and the identity number. And then it sends this request to the API, uh, through, the, through the registration API to the API server and it registers this uh, client, this uh, pod, and then and this is the um, identity. So it, it will use the, the full uh, URL, but for brevity, I just shown you the, the number, but there are more information about um, the parent, which is a Cilium operator and so on. So, but for, for just brevity, I'll just show you the ID here. And then that I, uh, at some point, the Spire agent queries the Spire server and asks um, what pods I'm um, you know, responsible for and gets the identity of this pod. Um, so on each um, node, the Spire agent will be responsible for uh, um, requesting a certificate. Um, later on, we'll talk about that, but that each uh, Spire agent is only responsible for the pods that are on, on that node that uh, they reside. And then let's say we deploy our server part of our application and it goes through the same process. An identity is uh, generated and that um, being then um, uh, saved or uh, registered into the Aspire server. Now we have two pods that are registered inside our Aspire server. Uh, and also obviously, and uh, Cilium operator um, agent and uh, Spire agent, they've gone through the same process and they also have their own identity registered here. Okay, at this point, and now we have the client and server, but as there is no um, security policy set up, so all and this client can call the server, or for that matter, any client can call into the to our server environment, which obviously is not good. We want to, the goal is to, first of all, set up a, a, a policy that only this client can call to this server, and furthermore, this client will need to authenticate itself. So in order to do that, we need to create a Cilium um, network policy. And we'll go through that in more detail during the demo, but basically that consists of uh, specifying um, uh, what endpoint, uh, what caller is allowed to call in, and we specify that with the label, so app equal to server. Um, sorry, what what policy this is for, and, and this one is we are setting it for our server, and our server has a label called app is equal to server. So we are talking about our server, and we also then set up define an ingress who's allowed to call in and what uh, they're allowed to do. So this is the ingress part from so basically what clients are allowed in this case only our clients allowed to come in and that's again specified by a matching label app is equal to client and then this is the important part we, and this is where we set up and the mutual authentication and we say authentication mode is equal to required so um, when the client calls in they need to be authenticated need to authenticating itself and the authentication is a mutual authentication because both will be needing to authenticate themselves. We'll go through that a little bit later. And then we specify um, the two ports or what ports the client is allowed to call in. In this case, it's AD80, and the protocol is TCP. And then we also set up the rules and when they actually get in, what they can do. Um, in this case, they, are, they can only request get. They can do a delete or update. And then what method they they can call in this case slash computer. So once that is uh, sent to the API server, uh, let's say it's a YAML, we execute that YAML, it goes to the Cilium network policy. So now we have this policy set up. And so let's say 
this client wants to communicate to a server. So it initiates a, a you know initial frame uh, set up set up the frame and the packet and wants now to send it to the server. But the CNN environment says not so fast. We have to check to see if you're allowed to call in or your um, are you allowed to call into the server? In this case, uh, you need to um, be authenticated. So. Is authentication required? The answer is yes, because we just set up our policy and that requ this requires authentication. So the request then goes to, checks the auth table to see if it's already been uh, um, authenticated already. And this is the first call, so it's not authenticated. Then what happens is actually drops the request. The packet is, at this point, is, um, is dropped because it needs to go through the authentication process. And now we'll go from the data pad, which is in the EBPF, a completely to a different environment. So now it called into the Cilium agent here. So we are completely separated now, disconnected from the data pad. And all the certificates that are exchanged here and all the activities are completely unknown and uh, you know um, uh, completely hidden from um, this part here. So the request goes to the um, odd Cache, authentication cache, again, this is empty. We haven't, uh, it hasn't been authenticated yet. Then the request uh, goes to what is known as a pluggable authentication interface. So as we discussed earlier, uh, in the future, currently only Spire server is supported as the interface, but in the future, other auth authenticator might be added. So in this case, we are, we'll be using the Spire server. So the first thing that the agent does, it needs to attest or um, verify the identity of the workload that, that is our client, this pod, to ensure that this is not a rogue, word, uh, rogue uh, uh, pod, you know, and it's actually was created in this environment. And since this is a you know agent, um, CDM agent itself, so it knows about the client and it can verify that, yes, it's coming from it's legit, it's coming from this cluster. And then it sends a request to the workload API because it now require, requires a certificate in order to set up the mutual authentication. So it's, um, a certificate is required. And then the agent calls into the API server. API server generates a certificate for our client here and then sends it to the agent and in turn, agent sends it to the um, Cilium um, agent. So on the other side, because this uh, Cilium agent will inform the other agent that this call is coming. And so this agent also needs to go through the same process and request a certificate for the, the client on its side. And now we are ready to do mutual authentication. And that is handled through what is known as TLS Session Manager. So a TLS handshake is initiated, and this is exactly the way we described it in, uh, at the beginning when we talk about the MTLS. So um, the but first of all, the handshake is the client initiates a handshake, basically says, this is uh, you know what kind of what version of TLS um, I support and so on, and then it goes through the process of each one of these sending certificates to the other side, and those certificates will be uh, validated, first of all, to ensure it's not has not been expired, and also validate the signature on the certificate using the trust bundle to ensure that it's coming from a trusted source and the signature has not been uh, you know, tampered with, and it happens on both sides. That's what is called uh, MTLS or MUHTLS. The only difference here is um, there is no encryption here because again, remember, we separated the encryption from um, authentication. So we only, in this case, we're only concerned about authentication. So if the handshake is su successful on both sides, then the odd cache and odd table are updated. And now uh, this uh, client has been already authenticated. Then the packet is recreated and then sends without any issue going through the to the server. As long as this session is valid, then uh, no uh, further authentication is required.
So before walking through the process of installing Cilium and Spire together, uh, we talked about an important prerequisite, and that prerequisite is you need to set up a default storage class before proceeding with the installation. So let's walk through that process. Um, if you are in a cloud situation, then cloud providers usually provide you know, storage classes for you so you can leverage those. Otherwise, you have to set up your own environment. And the easiest way to do that is to set up an NFS storage class. And for that, you need to install the NFS server on a server that you designate as your storage server. For your learning purposes, this could be one of your Kubernetes worker load. In any case, you need to install the NFS server. This is how you do it. Then you create um, a folder that you want to export or share. And then on line 12, this is how you share that folder, or in Linux they call it export, in Windows they call it share. But anyway, it means the same thing. This is how you export that, and then you need to restart, restart the server, the NFS server. Then on the Kubernetes side, on the Kubernetes master, it, uh, the first thing that you need to do is probably make sure that you can manually mount the folder that you, uh, or the directory that you shared out or exported. You want to make sure that you can actually load that into a volume. So um, to do that, first you need to install the NFS client for that. And then once you install that, then you can mount that. And this is the command line that you use. It's just change your... Um, IP address that you for your uh, server, for your storage server, and then you mount that. And then after successfully mount that, you can then unmount it. So this is basically to ensure that you can manually uh, um, load the, uh, or access the exported uh, directory before doing anything else. Because although if you can't access that, for sure, Kubernetes won't be able to access it. There's any permission problems or some other issues, if you didn't set up the um, folder correctly, uh, the export correctly, then you know go back and check that. And then next thing that you need to do is we need to install what is known as a provisioner. So this is called a dynamic provisioner. So there are two types of storage. One is dynamic and the other one is uh, static. So static, you have to manually create uh, the, the storage classes. But having a, a dynamic provisioner and then uh, those are done automatically by this provisioner and this is where you get that so you can use helm and you need to ins uh, you can then um, install it into the uh, repo in the helm repo and this is basically how you set up install the um, provisioner and then once you install that if you if you want to uninstall the provisioner, this is how you uninstall that in case you want to redo it, just delete, and this is the NFS provisioner. Once you deploy that, once they successfully installed, then um, look for a deployment, and that deployment is called NFS uh, dash subdirector sub there uh, dash uh, external provisioner. Make sure that the pods are ready, and then also you can look at the pods. And this is the pod. So basically, it creates a pod. So the provisioner is actually a Kubernetes pod. And that manages the creation of uh, storage for you, for Kubernetes. And then um, we can also check the storage class. So kubectl get storage class. And this is NFS client. So this is the name that we will be using. Uh, providing it to the installer, and we go back to the installation process. And so this is the name of our provision, um, uh, the storage class. So an important part that I sh specified here, uh, we are not done yet. Although we created the storage class, we need to make that storage class as the default storage class. Otherwise, it won't work. So this is how you set the storage class to be the default. And then once you do that, we then we can talk about setting up the going through the process. So the first part 
is uh, assuming that you already set up a Kubernetes environment, uh, the master and uh, worker nodes, uh, you need to install now the uh, Cilium CNI. So you download this CLI first, and then you add the Cilium. Um, if you're using Helm, add the Cilium to the repository. And then you download the executable, the, the server, the Cilium server itself. And this is a command to actually install the um, Cilium with uh, Spire. And that's what we kind of went through the presentation also. So these are all the different options that you need to set. And the last one is the storage class. And that would be, if you're using NFS, would be NFS client that we saw earlier. So now let's explore the Cilium Spire uh, integration. So the first thing we need to, know, to do is to, we need to verify that uh, Spire um, installation has been successful and everything is working. So on line three, kubectl got get pods minus and Cilium Spire. So all the artifacts related to a, a Spire are created under Cilium dash Spire. So let's get all the pods. And we want to make sure that everything, all these pods are running and in running state. So <clears throat> as you can see, there are two agents because I have two <clears throat> worker nodes. And also this is a Spire server. So the Spire dash server dot zero. So this is basically the, the brain of the whole operation as far as identity is concerned. And we see that it's in running state. Now, if you don't um, install the uh, storage, the default storage that we talked about earlier, then this um, Spire agent will remain forever in the pending state. So if you see that pending, one reason could be that you haven't allocated the default storage. So you need to do that first. And then um, to also, we can also run this command to ensure that uh, the, the whole uh, Spire infrastructure is healthy. So kubectl exec, so we're going to exec into the Cilium Spire server dash zero that we just saw. And we're going to run this command. So slash opt slash Spire slash bin Spire slash Spire dot server. So this is basically where the CLI resides for this uh, Spire server. And just run the health check. So we, let's run that. And you should see uh, server is healthy. Again, if your server is not healthy, it will tell you. And you need to troubleshoot to, as to why it's not healthy. OK, next step is to want to make sure that <clears throat> on the agents are um, att attested and ready to go. Uh, so kubectl exec again, we're going to exec into the Spire server. And this time we're going to run agent list. So let's go ahead and run that. And we'll see that we have two agents because we have two nodes. And um, so this, this basically, again, shows you that um, these agents are um, already uh, attested, and the attestation type you can see is K8S. So, uh, as you recall, there are different attestation and for agents for Cilium for Spire agent, and then we run into various environments. One of which is um, uh, Kubernetes. So, uh, it has its own attestation we, that we talked about earlier. And also, we want to make sure that the Cilium agents and operator uh, have been attested. So on line 13, again, we're going to inside, we're going to exec into the uh, Spire server. And then this time we're going to uh, look for, um, the, the, the command is entry show dash parent. And this is the, uh, the, the parent. So we are looking for all the children that were created by a Spire agent. So let's run that. And we'll see that there are two of them, one for um, a Cilium agent and the other one for operator. So this is Cilium agent. And the parent ID is 
aspire that um, dash agent and the next one is aspire uh, the cilium agent uh, cilium operator sorry and again it was created by aspire agent so again the um, cilium agent and operator they go through the attestation process also like the pods Okay, now that we see that our environment, uh, Aspire server is up and healthy, let's go ahead and create um, a client and server app that we talked about in the presentation. So we have a Hello World application that I created, um, which we will be using as the server or service part of our application. Let's go ahead and run that. Then we create um, a deployment for the service so we can easily access that and then on line 23 we verify the service that we just created and this is the server the service this is the name of it and the type is node port and this is their cluster ip okay so in order to make it easier to uh, call the service let's go ahead and capture the cluster ip that we just saw and let's put that into a variable, just for convenience sake. And then we echo it out, and so this is the IP address of the cluster IP. Let's do a quick test and, and call one of the methods on that service. So click on that, and message, okay, so this basically is what we need to, we should expect from when the server or service is healthy. So at this point, um, there is no uh, policy set up so any pod can, you know, any client can call into this service, which is really not a good idea. So we want to set up a policy that only our client that we're going to create next is able to call into this service. So we create an object called Cilium Network Policy. Um, we gave it a name, and then under spec, we have endpoint selector. And the label that we're going to use is um, called app server. So this is our server part of just deployed. And then we set up an ingress rule that is who or what can access the service. So from endpoints, and then we're going to use again another uh, match label. And this time we're going to use um, app equal to client. So this is the client that we're going to um, create next, but we're just going to create a policy first. So all the any application that has this label will be able to call into the service. Now we set up the port, the rules for the ports. So we can't just call in to any ports. <clears throat> we only we allow to uh, we, we only we application will be allowed only to call into port 8080 and use TCP protocol. Also for what um, operation can they do? They can only do a get operation and they can only call this method called computer. So let's go ahead and run this. So that's created. So let's go back to our application. And now next we're going to uh, create our client application. On line 23, we'll create this uh, again as a hello world application, just basically an uh, Nginx pod. And on line 33, let's go ahead and see if we can call the, the service uh, through the uh, cluster IP. So let the exec into the, the pod we just created called client. And then we're going to call the, the, the service and the, the method called computer. Let's go ahead and do that. And we'll see that we get results because we gave the client permission to do that. Now let's do uh, the, the service as another uh, method called health. Let's see if the client is allowed to allow access that and we get access denied because we did not give that access to it. Okay, so now let me clear this. <clears throat> now let's uh, kind of play around with the um, client, <coughs> the identities. First, we're going to get the identity of the, the service pod we just created earlier. Um, so if you recall, when a pod is created through um, using Cilium, Cilium creates a, 
what is known as selenium identity. So that's just basically <coughs> how selenium keeps track of various parts. So let's go ahead uh, and once it creates that <coughs> identity, <coughs> it will use that selenium identity to register the newly created part with the selenium uh, with the Aspire server. <coughs> so let's first <coughs> get the uh, identity of the the, 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 the part and the, the command is uh, kubectl get selenium endpoint minus L. So this is a label app equal to ser server. So get the endpoint, selenium endpoint, which has this label app is equal to server. And then we do a JSON path. And what we're looking for is something called identity dot ID. So this would be the identity, uh, selenium identity of the service. So let's go ahead and get that. And now we use that identity to <coughs> go inside Spire and get the Spiffy ID that is associated with that ID. So on line 41, cubes, um, again, we're going to exec into the Spire server. Um, and then we um, run this command, um, show entry, uh, Spiffy ID, and then the, the, the Spiffy ID that matches this, Spiffy and dot cilium slash identity and our, our identity that we just provided. So this is basically how <coughs> the our pod was um, registered <coughs> by <coughs> the cilium um, operator when it was created. So these are the information. So you got the entry ID, <coughs> the spiffy ID, which is the um, basically this is the this identity ID that we got up here. And then this is the parent, which is the Cilium operator. And then um, we got some other information. And then so the selector is <coughs> Cilium, colon, mutual auth. So all the um, top, um, artifacts, all the pods that are created by the Cilium um, operator will have this selector. Okay, next, <coughs> we're going to um, get all the um, entries that were uh, have this selector we just talked about. So uh, again, we are going to exec into this um, Spire server, and what we are looking for, um, the selector, so all the, um, all the objects that have this selector, Cilium, Mutual, Auth, that we just saw. So we are looking for all the... Um, uh, uh, artifacts that, that were registered by the um, Cilium operator. So we see they get a list of all the operators that uh, all the artifacts that were registered, including our two um, plots that be generated, be created, they're all listed here. And then if you run another command, which if you get all the Cilium um, identities, kubectl get Cilium identity, if you run this, then we get the list of all the uh, IDs. And these will, be, will match with the identity, with the Spiffy ID that we uh, got that earlier. So all of them, all of these are created by uh, the operator. And so these are the Cilium assigned IDs. And those will be used to register uh, various pods uh, with the uh, Spire. Okay, now let's um, enable mutual um, auth. So let's uh, go ahead and run this. So this is exactly the same as the same policies that we just created earlier, mutual auth. The only thing that we add is authentication required. So that's the only thing that we added. So in this case, any service that is, that is called into our service needs to be authenticated. So let's go ahead and run that. Let's go back to the application here. And then now we want to verify uh, that, you know, um, the authentication um, is happening and we can verify that. Let's go ahead and clear this. And to do that, we need to run 
um, the Cilium in debug mode, and this is the command to do that. <coughs> um, I've already done that. So what, once you do that, then you know you want to make sure that because it will restart the the, the it, it will recreate the Cilium agent. So you want to make sure that um, Cilium agent are up and running. So that is on line 60. Let's go and make sure that we see that both of them are running here. So let me clear this. So let's go ahead and now uh, run on this command here. Uh, let's do um, call the service again. I go ahead and do that. And see that it took a little bit longer this time because it went through the um, va validation and authentication process. So in order to see, to verify that, we need to look at the logs in the um, of the agent on that the pod, the service pod was running on. So we need to get to figure out where, uh, what node it was running on. So the, the, the service is running on. So we do this command with kubectl get pod minus o of i. And then grab, we are looking for the, the pod name, here, which is our server pod. So let's go ahead and do that. And then echo it out. So this is, the, it's running on node one. So you also want to, see what agent is associated um, with that pod, uh, which owns that pod. So we kubectl minus n cube system, get pods, and, and then minus us. So this is the label is app equal to Cilium. And then we do a grep. What we're looking for is for that node that we got earlier. So let's go ahead and do that. And then echo agent. So this is, so this is the agent that is responsible for, for that uh, pod or server part. And then on line 72, uh, we're going back again inside, um, look at inside the agent, so kubectl uh, minus c, cilium agent log. So we're looking at the logs and the agent, which is this one. And then we are looking for policy is requiring authentication on, or validating on this one here, server, SNI, or validated certificate and um, by successful. So we want to uh, look at all the logs that have these attributes or these uh, sentences in them. So let's go ahead and run that. And we'll see that these are the, uh, the what uh, um, validation, or the, let's go through the validation process. So policy is requiring authentication. So when the client calls into the server, um, then it, because that we set up the policy, then we need to, it needs to authenticate. So the local identity, so this is the um, Cilium identity, the, the server identity, and the remote, this is the identity of our client. So that's, uh, and then it goes through the validating, validation process and then it um, validate the certificate of the client, and then it finally says successfully um, authenticate. So this is how you can verify as you set up your own environment. This is how we can you can validate that um, authentication is successful. Let's take a look at the log. So this concludes um, this episode. Um, I hope you enjoyed it. If you do, please give it a like and subscribe if you haven't done so. Hopefully we'll see you in the next episode.